Hey everyone, Brian from Sui Generis Brewing here. It is Saturday, November 25th. Although if I'm being honest, it's pretty late at night, so you're not gonna get this video until Sunday at the earliest. Uh, and it's time for episode 16 of the 50 Meter Beer Project. Now it's been basically a month since my last video. I apologize for that, but I mean, life's just been crazy. I haven't had a chance to sit down and record any video, but I have made a fair amount of progress on the 50 Meter Beer Project, and we're getting very close to brew day. Um, probably my next video will be brew day. So we're almost there. In my last video, I malted the Harrington barley, which was the somewhat modern malting grade barley that I produced over the summer. And since then I have also malted the bear barley. This is the 1200 year old sort of medieval era barley that I also grew over the summer. That barley I malted a little bit differently than the Harrington because I was aiming for a little bit more of a character malt. Uh, so there I made something closer to a brew malt. It's quite easy to make. I'm not going to go through the details because my last video went into it in a lot of depth. The short version is that I soaked the grain to get up to around 46% moisture, at which point I allowed it to germinate. And then I kilned it at, I believe it was around 50 degrees Celsius for 16 hours. And that sort of longer medium temperature kilning sort of allows more Maillard reactions to take place. It should develop a lot of malt flavor within that grain and hopefully still retain some of its diastatic power. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So that went pretty much flawless. Unlike the Harrington, I had no issues with bacterial growth or anything like that. And the malt itself looks really nice. But the only problem I've had with it is the rootlets are really hard to get off of that grain. Uh, the Harrington was much, much easier to clean the roots from. But other than that, it was a very easy grain to prepare and it came out quite nicely. So the other thing I've done since my last video is I have done a conversion test on the malt to make sure that it actually is malt and that it's able to self convert uh, and create sugars that we can now ferment into beer. The way I did this was fairly simple and straightforward. I measured out 10 grams of my malt. I blended it to a relatively fine powder in my spice blender. And then I added it to three times its weight in water, already warmed to 66 degrees Celsius, which is sort of an average mash temperature. And I then held those little mini mashes at that temperature by placing them into my pressure cooker with the temperature set to 66 Celsius. I also ran some proximity malt through this, uh, this being a, a commercially produced pale ale malt just as essentially a positive control as well as a benchmark to measure my grains against. Every 15 minutes, I took a small sample of each uh, mini mash and put that onto a little bit of iodine on a spot plate just to see how conversion was progressing. Much to my surprise, my bear actually converted faster than the commercial malt, it took half an hour, and that mash had, was no longer positive in the iodine test, whereas it took 45 minutes for the proximity malt to make it to full conversion. Unfortunately though, the Harrington malt seems to struggle a little. Uh, if you look at the picture I've put up above, you can see that even at the last time point, 105 minutes, it is still struggling to convert. Uh, and, and I know in the image, it actually looks like it hasn't converted at all. But if you've done iodine tests in the past, you'll know that when there's a lot of starch present, it's an instant reaction. And when you're getting close to conversion being complete, you can actually see as the reaction takes place and the solution darkens, it's not instant. And I was starting to see that at that final time point. So maybe given enough time, it might self convert. I actually suspect the problem is that lactic acid bacteria that grew on the malt. There was a fair amount of it. I think the malt is fairly acidic and we probably just were outside of the ideal pH range. So that means when it comes to brewing this beer, there's some things I may have to do to account for that acidity. Now I am just hoping that that really potent bare barley malt will be able to just convert everything, give the extra enzymes that are needed to finish that off and that I won't need to do anything. But if the pH is really quite low, I may need to add some chalk. Uh, in order to bring the pH up to a more reasonable mash pH. Now that it kind of breaks the 50 meter rule because I don't have any chalk available on my property, uh, but I'd rather sort of break my 50 meter rule than not make beer. 
Of course, the other thing I can look at doing if I need to is to blitz up a little bit of commercial malt and add that in as well, just to help give some extra enzyme. And that of course is something I could always do midway through the mash if it's not progressing as I hope it will. Now, while I was doing these mini mashes, I was also using my refractometer to measure the gravity of the wart that was being produced in those little mini mashes. My goal there was just to get a rough idea of how much sugar I could expect out of my malt Again, using that proximity malt as a baseline. So once that proximity malt had completed conversion, that three to one ratio of water to grain had a gravity of 1084, which I think is pretty average for pale ale malts um, in that sort of a concentrated mash environment. Much to my surprise, the bear barley was only 10 points lower than that. It came in at 1073. I was really surprised by this because a lot of sources I've read claim that bear barley only has about half the starch in it that uh, more modern strains do. And that's about 84%, uh, not 50%. So there's a little bit more there than I had anticipated. But what really surprised me was the Harrington barley because as I mentioned a few seconds ago, it wasn't converting very well. But even so, by the one hour time point, it was at a gravity of 1060. By the 90 minute time point that had gone up to about 1074 and when I finally pulled the plug at 105 minutes it was actually up to 1081 so just shy of the proximity malt and it still had a little bit of conversion left to go so I, I was really shocked by that I'm not too sure what to make of that but apparently acidity issues or whatever the enzyme issue is there aside the amount of sugar available in that malt seems to be pretty good so with that I am basically ready to brew and it's time to start formulating my final recipe. Uh, as a reminder, or if you're new here, I isolated yeast it's a couple months ago now, actually from the, the living barley plants that eventually gave rise to this malt. I've grown hops and I'm now growing barley that I've converted into malt. So I have everything in place that I need to brew this beer. Uh, but formulating the recipe I think is gonna be a little bit challenging for a couple of reasons. First reason being that, you know, even though I've done this malt conversion test, it's still not entirely clear exactly how much gravity I'm going to get out of this homemade malt. It looks like I'm going to be somewhere around maybe the 85%, 90% gravity of what I should expect from commercial malt, but there's no guarantees. The second issue, of course, is the amount of malt that I actually produced this year was less than I was hoping for, so I'm probably looking at doing a half batch of beer, somewhere around 12 liters rather than a full 20 liter batch. But the real fly in my ointment, of course, is the hops. I have no idea what the alpha acid content of them is, and there isn't really any practical way for me to figure that out. And yet I want to use those homegrown hops for bittering, for flavor, and for aroma additions. So that's gonna create a little bit more of a challenge. I mean, adapting to the barley uh, conversion rate's fairly easy. I mean, like the gravity you get the gravity you get, but how do we deal with those hops? So what I'm gonna do for the, re the recipe itself is I'm going to aim for a hopping profile similar to a pale ale. My rationale behind that is that'll let me taste the malt, it'll let me taste the hops without anything really overly dominating that beer. It also should leave enough room for the yeast to express itself as well. So for bitterness, the plan is fairly simple. I'm going to assume that my hops have sort of the average alpha acid content of the commercial hops, the middle of the road. That's probably more than they actually have, but if I make that assumption, then what I can do is I can aim for a bitterness unit to gravity ratio, typical of a pale ale, assuming that my hops fall in the middle of that range, and if they're a little on the low side, it should still be okay, just be a little sweeter than I would normally expect, and if it's a little high, it'll just be a little bit closer to an IPA than to a pale ale, but in either case, that bitterness level should work out. Luckily, the flavor and aroma uh, additions are a little bit simpler. We don't get very much bitterness from those, uh, so I should be able to just dose those in around uh, 14 grams or a half ounce each, and it should give a fair amount of hop character with, again, it not being too dominating and, and not uh, leaving room for the yeast and the malt to come through. So that's sort of the plan for the beer. I am gonna basically have to plan on the fly because I'm gonna have to adjust my bittering additions to whatever gravity it is that I end up with. I may have to make some mid mash adjustments if I'm not getting good conversion. Uh, but hopefully at the end of the day, I will have a fairly reasonable beer. 
Now I do have a few other plans in mind for this. A big one is actually going to be that I am going to mash in a larger volume than I normally would, and I'm going to boil for two hours. And my rationale there is twofold. Uh, the first is I want to get as much out of this grain as I can, and by collecting that extra volume and then concentrating it with a boil, I can just improve my efficiency and get a little bit more extraction that way. But my second rationale for that long boil is again, I had a lot of lactic acid bacteria growth in the uh, Harrington malt. Uh, that is the bulk of the malt going into the beer. It's about 60% of the total malt bill. And I'm a little worried about some of the off flavors and off aromas that that's produced. And so the longer boil should drive off at least some of the more volatile uh, components of that and hopefully give me a little bit cleaner of a malt profile than I might have if I just used it straight up. I really think I'm kind of in a, in a sour malt territory uh, with that grain. So the spear's probably gonna be a little bit tart, but I'm hoping by boiling it a little longer, I can maybe drive off some of the aromas that came along with those bacteria. So I don't know exactly when brew day is going to be. I'm hoping for next weekend, but it's sort of weather and time and, and other life uh, event dependent. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, but I'll obviously be posting a video on brew day. I'll try and capture some video as I brew, hopefully of beer being made and not just me being frustrated. Uh, and I'll get that up as soon as it's done. Uh, anyways, with that, thank you for joining me again. And I'll hopefully see you in a week or two. Bye.